Hey everyone, how's it going? Hope you had a great weekend. As you could see, Sagar is back. He's really bummed that he missed out on the episode of Antonio Garcia Martinez. Definitely go back and check that if you're looking to see a great conversation on everything we love here. But today we have an episode you all have been asking for so much. We are with Bruno Mathaith to talk about foreign policy, geopolitics, and the U.S., China, basically everything under the sun you could ever imagine talking about. Yeah, I really enjoyed talking with Bruno. It was awesome. Bruno brings a good perspective because he's European, but he's also very tapped into American politics. And he can tell us how both America is being perceived, what we're getting wrong, what everybody gets wrong about China and more. It was He's just one of the most unique thinkers who's out there. I loved talking to him about everything here. Let's get to it. Bruno, welcome back to The Realignment. It's quite a pleasure to be back. Good to see you, Bruno. Good show. What I've always appreciated about you as a writer is that you combine the practical with the philosophical and the historical. Last time we had you on, your book, History Has Begun, had just come out, so that episode was more focused on the philosophical and historical. For this episode, especially considering your upcoming writing on geopolitics and our audience's incessant demand for more foreign policy focus areas, I would like to focus more on the practical today. So let's just start here. What exactly is geopolitics? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. So the term was invented about 100 years ago, and back then, you know, the, the suffix, the prefix uh, geo is supposed to refer to land, geography. And that's what it meant back then. It was about the scramble for territory, for control over territory and natural resources. Then it got transformed into this, this, this sort of living room in, in, in the Nazi uh, experience. Uh, which I think ended up affecting the, the reputation of the concept. But the concept is not older than 100 years. And then something odd happened. Uh, state, you know, state competition was understood as state competition for territory. But then, uh, I think as a result of technology mostly, state competition took other forms, economic, cultural, and it became a bit disconnected from territory. States are no longer as concerned about uh, acquiring territory. They're more concerned with other elements of state power. And so we now use the term geopolitics to refer to state competition, but we have somehow lost contact with that prefix geo, uh, turning the term into something a bit odd and difficult to understand. In my, recent, in my most recent book, that will come out in about a month, I actually argue that we're going back to that element. Uh, we're going back the connection to the earth because of climate change, uh, because of the pandemic. The external environment is becoming important again. It's not territory in the old sense, but still is the external environment. But certainly we went through a period of decades where states seem to operate disconnected from the external environment. It was relations between states themselves operating in a kind of void and the term geopolitics became rather, um, again, as I said, rather odd in its meaning. Uh, what was the geo doing there? Uh, it was not about land. It was not about territory. But maybe we're going back to that world again. State competition for control over the external environment. That's really fascinating to think about how it was born on land, then exited for a while and might be coming back or at the very least connection to the earth. Yeah. And so kind of what I'm hearing is there's all these different models which are competing with each other. And so not to get to like grad school seminar, but like what are the different things that are interplaying in terms of there are different ways to view geopolitics. What is all playing with each other right now? When you talk about different models, do you are you thinking about, you know, there's a Western model, there's a Chinese model? Yeah, there's exactly. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest stories of our time. Um, you know, for as long as we remember, and even for as long as, as the books we read uh, remember, we've had one single model, uh, the Western Enlightenment model of organizing societies. And, you know, power has passed from... Uh, the Netherlands, to France, to Britain, to the US. But in a way, 
each of these of these countries appeared as the best representative of the Western way of life. And that's been the story for at least 250 years, 300 years. I think now we're entering a, a different period where we no longer have a dominant model. We have alternative models. Uh, and it's, it's fascinating. In a way, we're going back to a period let us go back, say, to 16th century. We have the Ottoman Empire, we have the Habsburg Empire, we have the Safavid Empire, we have uh, the Mughal Empire. And they, uh, they, they, they are organized in different ways. They represent different civilizations. We have the Ming Empire in China. And so in a way, we're going back to that with one critical difference that those empires were separated, uh, clearly separated. They weren't integrated. They were not part of the same system. So what we have today is, I think, entirely novel from a historical point of view. We have different models competing among themselves. Um, they all have a stake and a claim uh, to being better than the alternatives, but they're all part of the same global system. And we never had that before. It's as if we have globalization as we had it for 200, 300 years, but not organized on a single Western model, but being potentially organized under different models. And these models are in fact competing among each other to see who can organize the global system. Absolutely. I think the key insight there is that globalization is value neutral. It just means being interconnected. It doesn't necessarily, I mean, in the 90s, it means being Western-centric and pushing that, but we live in a different age, and it kind of strikes me, when did this change? If I were to say there was, I would say 2003, the invasion of Iraq, I think that might be one. Maybe it's much more recent. A lot of liberals would say 2016 with election of Trump. What do you think? It's, uh, it, it, it's difficult. You know, sometimes um, in Russia, where really you have um, some of the most uh, creative and, and, and deep discussions about geopolitics. There's this tradition of thinking geopolitically in Russia. And uh, you hear from uh, Russian thinkers on geopolitics that things started to change with the advent of nuclear weapons. Mm. Because that's really the, mom the moment when if you have the best army in the world, well, if the other side has nuclear weapons, uh, there's a limit to what you can do. Uh, you certainly cannot invade and conquer that territory. So it did work as a way to, in a way, dilute power and redistribute power. And certainly, you know, let's be honest, if, if there weren't nuclear weapons and if Russia didn't have nuclear weapons, uh, we would see a certain continuous pressure uh, to... Um, um, for Russia in a way to, to change its ways. Um, yeah. But you have this sort of blocking power that nuclear weapons give you. Then there are more recent dates, but there's something to this, that this goes back, you know, I also have an essay saying that in fact, it goes back to 1919, where suddenly all the great empires in Asia are no longer satisfied being subordinate to the West. You have rebellions in India, you have rebellions in China, you have rebellions in, in Turkey. They're all happening at the same time. If you want to think about more recent dates, yes, I think Iraq is important. Uh, and there's one even more recent that one should think about, uh, and that is kind of the most striking example that I could give. And that's uh, uh, Syria in 2013, hmm. where suddenly President Obama decides not to apply his red line, uh, decides not to bomb uh, Syria, even after there's conclusive evidence that chemical weapons have been used. And on top of that, a few months later, Russia goes in into a country that it's not in its immediate neighborhood without consulting with anyone else. That, you know, I remember clearly is a moment when you really think the world system is changing. And it's this very different. This is implicit in what you were saying about the West's dominance over the past 500, 600 years. But if you go back to the Cold War, even communism is a Western concept. Marx comes up with communism, does a lot of the writing in London. So that, in a weird way, it's global, but it's still a Western-centric fight. Yep. Stalinism, all those different bits. So what's unique about this moment is it's not merely that you have Eurasian 
Asia Pacific, Indo Pacific, pick whatever word you wanted for it, powers competing with Western ones. It's that in many ways, Asian powers are doing this within their own specific history and context in a way that wasn't true during the Cold War. So can you just talk about A, what the actual models in the Eastern part of Asia are, and then what the implications of this difference from the Cold War era are? Yes, I think you're absolutely right. You know, the, the story used to be that great powers that were not part of Europe, um, when they sort of graduated into great powers, they did that by becoming European and, you know, by being absorbed and by being adopted. That happened with the Ottoman Empire, uh, perhaps uh, sometime in the um, 18th century. It happened with the Russian Empire, uh, not part of Europe, but, uh, you know, the way to become a great power was to become European. And obviously that's not what's happening now. China is not becoming Western or European, but it is becoming a great power on its own terms. Now, if you ask me what's distinctive about, about the Chinese model, um, it's, it's difficult, it's a delicate question. Uh, on the one hand, certainly an element of uh, collectivism that is present there, uh, a sense which we saw during the pandemic that uh, the individual has to be understood as part of a larger whole. There's also a very strong element of pragmatism practice before theory. This has a long tradition in Chinese history, and then it becomes explicit, for example, with Deng Xiaoping. Um, he has many famous sayings, and they all go to the point of saying, we don't have a theory. We move with history. Uh, we move with new developments, and we adapt to those new developments. You take advantage of those new developments. The third pillar, I would say, is technology. A, it's a regime that understands itself in terms of fast technological progress and understands power as being fundamentally technological. I think you have to combine these three pillars, uh, collectivism, pragmatism, and technology. This is, I think, the, the three inspiring guides of, uh, of the Chinese regime. What about the Indian system, Bruno? Well, in India, we're seeing something very interesting, um, an attempt to recover the long uh, Indian or Hindu tradition. And, you know, one might hesitate between using one term or the other. If you say Hindu, people might think you're talking about religion, not necessarily. But the thought here, as I see it, and coming from conversations with, with Indian thinkers is this, um, and to put it as, as bluntly and as simply as possible, in as impressive a way as we can, why should the Indian tradition be understood and made to fit within liberalism when the Indian tradition is thousands of years old? And back to the Vedas, I don't know, four or 5,000 years old, perhaps more. This is still a debate going on. Whereas liberalism is 200 years old or 300 years old. Why not the other way around? Why shouldn't liberalism make its contribution within the framework of, uh, of the Indian tradition? And, and that's how I see uh, Indian uh, thinkers increasingly thinking about the question. Um, and obviously, once you start thinking in these terms, uh, kind of a whole new world opens up. Um, because we're used to thinking of, in a rather childish way. We're used to thinking in terms of, you know, every political value is understood within liberalism and everything outside liberalism is an anti-value. But obviously, you know, during these 5,000 years of a glorious political, social, cultural history, uh, there were many values represented in that tradition, including some that would also be close to us, religious tolerance. But religious tolerance was not invented by liberals 200 years ago. In fact, you have richer resources to deal with the problem of, of religious diversity and conflict within the Hindu tradition than you have within liberalism. And I think increasingly people are realizing this, that liberalism was excellent providing solutions 100 years ago, but now it's increasingly struggling. And one important element here is actually to go into other traditions and find new resources to deal with problems we have today. 
Yeah. It's, it's funny. And I'm really glad that you brought this up because I see this very much in my own understanding of India. Um, you know, my parents are from India, the India as a child that I was taught existed was this like Nehru, you know, Gandhi democracy. And within my adult life, it completely changed within 10 years. And now it's exactly as you're saying. And I do see that as a rapid decline of again, Western liberal, not even Western liberal tradition, the Western geopolitical organized model that a lot of people in India can think simultaneously, we can be very close allies with the West. We also don't want to organize ourselves like the West at all. And so if we want to consider the players, like the players themselves, I think what's just so crazy about this is that Joe Biden is president. And so in the middle of all this, this change and all this, and there's a lot of reasons Joe Biden is president. Part of the reason why is because he's so old school. If I were to find a place, though, that he's probably maybe at the most mismatched, at least in my opinion, it seems to be foreign policy. This seems to be somebody deeply ingrained in like the ways of NATO, um, understands himself as like Angela Merkel is the first person I call, you know, that... And that just doesn't seem like accordant whatsoever with a lot of what the, how the world is working today. And this isn't like a NATO Trump critique. I'm just like, I don't think that this, that's the most important thing that you should be worrying right now if you're the president of the United States. What do you think of Biden in the context of everything we're saying here right now? Right. I would tend to agree with you yeah. that uh, he, he comes from a different world, uh, called warrior. Um thinks of the world in those terms. Um, now, his predecessors uh, had s- some of the same problems. Uh, let's be honest about that. Of course, but, yeah. Um, He's not uh, unique in this. <laughs> that's right. And clearly, yeah. clearly the US political class is still trying to develop new ways of thinking and the process is, is slow. Um, Barack Obama also struggled with this, but he had, he had some inkling of a certain revision uh, of, of his way of thinking. Uh, he had interesting things to say, for example, about Asia and prosperity in Asia and how that was in the interest of the US. Uh, he had developed a certain way of thinking about Southeast Asia that I think was interesting. Uh, Biden hasn't done any of that. So his leading idea seems to be a historical confrontation between democracies and uh, autocracies. Um, but I suspect he's going to struggle with this idea because, first of all, um, it is a very academic uh, way of looking at the issue. Even the term autocracy comes from academic discussions. Now, how do you classify a country as an autocracy or not an autocracy? Um, this is going to be very difficult. Um, is he going to consider the Philippines a democracy or an autocracy in Thailand? Uh, critical countries, by the way, in 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 the confrontation with the uh, uh, with China. Uh, I, I, I do have to say that in the case of India, he's shown some pragmatism. Um, hmm. uh, the US worked very closely with India during the, the, the recent uh, outbreak of Delta in India and kind of putting to the side the question about whether Modi uh, is um, a politician that Biden approves of. I suspect he doesn't approve of, but uh, they are focused on China. Uh, the same thing happened with Turkey. Uh, I had made the prediction before the election that relations with Turkey would become very difficult. They haven't. Uh, On the contrary, they've been quite stable. The U.S. has been pushing Turkey into playing a greater role in Afghanistan. It does seem that Turkey is going to take over security uh, at the Kabul airport. Um, And so what Biden means in theory is one thing. What he means in practice is confrontation with China. And the theory kind of is is, is dropped. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see how that evolves. But that's the story of the the first few months. Hmm. See, this is interesting because I'll just throw a thesis forward. Then the part of this which you can bring insight from the Cold War era is that pragmatism will probably increase the greater proximity you have to either China or to active conflict zones in the Middle East or Afghanistan. In both those cases. So you're going to have to be pragmatic when you're doing a South China Sea issues approaching the Philippines. That's far different from debates that you're probably going to see in, for example, Central Europe. 
Hungary. Those are the those are those are places where you're going to see the academic distinctions become a bit of an issue. But I just want to disagree with something Sagar said and then throw it to you, Bruno, and then Sagar, of course, respond mm-hmm. after that. I think NATO matters from a symbolic perspective because if I were to offer a straightforward critique of the Trumpian foreign policy, it was I don't think the NATO fight was the fight to have given, frankly, how important the China issues relative to everything else. So I think Biden, I don't think Joe Biden wakes up thinking, my NATO, my NATO, what's happening with NATO? He's not an Atlantic Council fellow. He doesn't think about things that intellectual way. I think he sees NATO and the G7 as stand-ins for allies are important. So in this broader geopolitical game, Bruno, how should the US conceive of allies? Because I feel as if something left, right, and center of it's in agreement on is that this isn't 2003. We're not invading Iraq with weak allies. This distinction matters. So what would you say to that? And Sagar, then please come in. Yeah. Let let me, let me uh, add what I think is a slightly different uh, perspective on this question of allies, because I don't think it's as simple as it sounds at first. I have a piece coming out tomorrow uh, about, uh, you know, this critical distinction between an ally and a dependency or a vassal. Uh, because what happened during the Cold War was you had genuine allies in Europe. And what an ally meant was you discussed things, um, you consulted beforehand, you took the other, uh, your allies' opinions into consideration. Sometimes your allies would say no. That's what being an ally means. On the other hand, the US had a relationship with its Asian allies that was not like this at all. In the case, let's say, of Philippines, but Japan, Indonesia, uh, and, and other countries in Asia, the relationship was much more one-sided. Um, the U.S. really didn't have any particular interest in a common project with these countries, didn't see them as part of the solution. Uh, it was interest just in preventing a communist takeover, for example, in the Philippines or Indonesia. Now, so it's a, it's a bit tricky because if the disproportion of power is too large, your allies transform into something else and the alliance stops working. And I now fear that we may be witnessing a kind of reversal of roles. India, Japan, and even smaller countries in Asia are rising in importance and status in Washington. And the danger we have in Europe is that in fact, within a decade or two, and we already had an inkling of that during the Trump years, that these European allies are gonna become what the Philippines was during the Cold War. They are given instructions, uh, they are given fed and complete. Uh, and this happened a lot during the, the Trump years, uh, threats also, uh, direct threats, open threats. Uh, and, and this is delicate. I think uh, Biden is, is struggling a little bit with this. He certainly wanted to correct that, um, those those Trump years, but it's difficult because this is not about psychology, this is about structural factors. Europe is less important for the US, Europe has fewer resources, the center of the action is in Asia, uh, and therefore there's a tendency, difficult to resist for the US to start treating its European allies as something less than an ally. And when you hear Europeans talk about strategic autonomy, it is the concern with this, with these developments and the fear that is starting to, to rise that, um, that we are gonna become in fact more vassals than allies. It's, it's a great danger because the West cannot survive if the two sides of the alliance are now so um, different in power, in capacities, in outlook. If the US is concerned with China and if, it doesn't, no longer cares about European capacities. This is no longer the West. This is no longer the transatlantic alliance. I think this is something to be concerned about as a European, but also as an American. See, that's interesting. And I guess, you know, I'll split the difference and I'll say, it's not that I'm anti-NATO. It just seems that NATO fetishism and much more is fine if they're going to help us with China. And it just doesn't seem to see a lot of that. I mean, instead, I see German industry, which is what Hugo Boss just put out a statement saying, actually, we proudly use Uyghur cotton. I'm like, okay. Um, You know, I see Huawei, uh, you know, signing nice big deals with Boris Johnson, our closest ally. And we have to throw the kitchen sink at Boris and we get like a 75%. And look, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm hearing it a little bit from what you're saying, Bruno, like we're are giving orders and yeah, I mean, you know, 
we are the global superpower. I mean, I, I, I is that what we're allowed to do? <laughs> you're, you're representing very well that spirit, yeah. which I think is is becoming more powerful in Washington, and which is, you know, it, it comes out of real, substantive facts. Um, that you have uh, a, a EU that is becoming more and more powerless, but at the same time, uh, does not reconcile itself with that fact. Uh, right. and, and this is a contradiction that Europeans have to solve as well. But clearly, uh, you know, there were people during the Trump years like Rick Grinnell, but also Mike Pompeo, who had completely lost patience with Europe. Yeah. And it was like either you acquire the capacities to be taken seriously, or then you cannot be taken seriously, and we won't take you seriously. But there are these kind of developments happening within NATO and within the West, which people sometimes don't want to talk about because they're not particularly pleasant, but they are happening. Mm -hmm. Something I'm curious about, because if there's one line of pushback we get from folks, especially the left end of our audience, is that Sagar and I refuse to reckon with <laughs> Western imperialism with America's foreign policy decisions during the Cold War. And I and I really am not trying to I'm not trying to mock this perspective because it's an important one. But at the same time, what frustrates the two of us, not to speak for you too much, Sagar, is that I think leftists or people on the left tend to bring up Allende, the Shah, all these 20th century decisions to obscure choices we have in front of us. So I don't think bad calls we made at the height of the Cold War give us any direction on how we should respond to Hong Kong or how we should conceive of Taiwan. So I'm curious, I know Sagar is too, what is your perspective as frankly a non-American? Obviously you're a Westerner, but let's focus on the America part of the ledger then. How should people who are interested in foreign policy in the U.S., reconcile the past empire, et cetera, with the present and most importantly, the future. Right. Well, you know, I think I'm part of the, of the, of that group who thinks that uh, American empire is not, it's not always been pretty, but, but that's what empire is about. So it doesn't particularly shock me and I don't compare it to some ideal of empire. I'm perfectly conscious that that's been the history of empire. Uh, if anything, the American empire has been, let us say, uh, more structural. Uh, the power is more at the level of the system itself, of financial flows, trade, uh, and so on. And so it's not ex ex exerted as directly. Uh, I suspect the Chinese empire would have some of these elements as well, uh, but obviously for a European would be based on completely different values. Uh, and that's also one consideration that we have to take in mind. For other countries, obviously, the, the American empire has been, uh, has been uh, based on ideas they don't share, uh, has been very present, very explicit, uh, particularly in Asia uh, and, and particularly, obviously, in China. So we have to be conscious that there are different perspectives about American power. Uh, even, let us say, within Europe, we have different perspectives. But for example, you know, for Western Europeans, we never really think of, a, of the American empire as an empire. We were always treated as allies. We are always treated as part of the directory of power. But if you go a little eastwards, even to Turkey, the experience is already very different, uh, that the power was more visible, uh, more explicit, more present. And then if you go to the Philippines, you have a different perspective. So that's, I think, one correction we need to, to have. The American empire was not homogeneous, and it never is. There are countries that are closer to the center, closer to Washington, and in a way, they feel part of it. There are countries that, are, that receive the brunt of, of that power. Now, uh, I do think there's some things during the Cold War that the U.S. is at risk of losing. So the kind of realism and pragmatism that we talked about at the beginning, you know, President Truman made a speech in Congress saying that the United States was going to defend democracies whenever it was necessary. But within one or two years, they were defending autocracies because that was necessary to face the, um, the Soviet Union. 
And now we're going to see if the perspective is uh, as realistic, as pragmatic, uh, and if the U.S. is going to be able to work with Vietnam, or if not, that, that's one question. Then, obviously, we have this question we haven't talked today about how the U.S. has changed. Uh, is that a good or a bad thing for this discussion about race uh, and racial equality? I can see on the one hand, um, in parts of Europe, you're already seeing this, that people are saying, look, this is no longer the old America. And so we have nothing to do with this. We have nothing to do with this wokeness. And we're not going to follow. Uh, French. America. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. French, I respect it. Oh. Obviously, uh, Hungary and many other countries, but also in Asia. But on the other hand, it might have a positive side in the sense that this will be an America that um, is more receptive to ideas of racial equality also in foreign policy. And that, for example, will not make the mistakes that were made in the past 20 years where really it became, you know, we have to be honest, it became about Islam and it became about Muslims worldwide. There was some resistance to that, but, but, but it wasn't sufficient. Uh, now, this new America of the past two or three or five years, which really looks like a new America, may be more capable of being self-aware about questions of race and ethnicity and be better, be able to appeal to countries that are not white um, in a way that really was never able to do throughout its history. So it's an interesting question that I raise more as a question. We don't have the answer yet. Uh, it might be less popular in places like France, but might be more popular in other places. Um, perhaps in Africa, but, but not only in Africa, uh, in the Muslim world as well. So it's exciting, but still maybe a bit too early, the way in which the discussion around wokeness is going to influence foreign policy. Well, I have, to, I have to channel our leftist listeners now. I'll take both sides of the question. Oh, God. Sagar, you know what they're thinking of. When you said wokeness what? challenging foreign policy, they are thinking of the, of the picture on Twitter of the B-52 mm -hmm. dropping bombs on Afghanistan. And then there's the Joe Biden B-52, which has the pride flag on every bomb and LGBTQ flags and everything. And I'm not saying this to mock racial minorities or LGBTQ people, but what I'm saying, the leftist audience is saying right now is, Bruno, what do you mean by wokeness influencing foreign policy? We've seen how wokeness will influence foreign policy. Raytheon will have diversity seminars and we will still have drone strikes and support um, you know, the government or what of what what's remaining of the government in, in in Yemen. So can you just can you expand a bit on this? Because this is just get, get, make it practical for us. How could you see, aside from the war on terror itself winding down, how could you see wokeness, a good faith version? Well, let's just be let's just say like more progressive ideas of race and gender to be fair and not use the pejorative woke. How can you see that affecting us foreign policy? Well, I, th I think we saw an inkling of that in, in the recent uh, uh, war in Gaza uh, and that the kind of new generation, both of politicians and uh, but of intellectuals in the U S it's not that they were closer to, to the Palestinian side of the debate because in some sense, the left in the US has always been, but it's that the arguments were different. Um, you know, I'm not gonna say that I agree or disagree. Uh, it's very delicate and, and contentious <laughs> debate. But when you, you know, the debate over the past two years in the US certainly prepared the country to go to the Middle East and have a fresh understanding of questions of race, ethnicity, settler colonialism, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the way in which uh, laws in Israel discriminate actively against the uh, Israeli Arab citizens, not against Palestinians in the West Bank, but against citizens of Israel that are Arab. Uh, and that's a question that, by the way, the U.S. was never even able to comprehend and the U.S. foreign policy elites in the past. It was concerned about stability in the Middle East, oil flows, how the Palestinian cause was, was creating instability in the Middle East. And so that's how it looked at it. If you now is able to look at Israel and see there are questions here of structural injustice and Arab citizens are not uh, first class citizens, which is a debate for which the last two years in the U.S., uniquely prepare people to understand. So it's just an example, but then it can be applied all over the world. With, I think, as I said, I think that's the way to say it, with some 
potential to produce good results. Because even if it doesn't, you know, if the U.S. is able to understand the problem, that's going to be met with respect by, by people who see that the U.S. understands it rather than pretending or just like the diplomatic language that is void and doesn't mean anything. So it has think, potential, yeah. but it also has some risks, but it has a lot of potential. Where I see it always conflicting is, I. by the way, I think you're right, and I think we're probably better off for having a discussion about, you know, Arab-Israeli rights. That being said, what I love is whenever they find themselves in conflict. So are Uyghurs second-class citizens in China? No. Actually, according to a substantial per part of the progressive left, if you even discuss um, Uyghur genocide or forced Uyghur abortion, you want to go to war with China. Okay. Um, so then, you know, hatred of the American empire makes it so, or, or not even that, perceived uh, wanting to go to attack a foreign country by bringing up humanitarian genocide or, or, you know, humanitarian violations is in and of itself out of this bounds. And it all just becomes very convoluted, which is why I think most of this stuff is just an absolute crock of nonsense. But it's, I want to return to this wokeness. Everybody in the world is talking about critical race theory, wokeness, and more. So why don't we just do it? Um, at least here in, in terms of foreign policy. It's fascinating because that's one of the best case I've ever heard for how this could be applied to benefit American foreign policy. But I'll ask you the inverse one that, frankly, I and a lot of other people see, which is I remember our, uh, I think it's our UN ambassador in her inaugural speech um, for under Biden to the United Nations said something along the lines of, you know, we acknowledge our painful, not even acknowledge, like outwardly bringing up like uh, racial disparities in the United States and uh, the constitution being fundamentally flawed and, and, and all that. And I just remember being, you know, I mean, it is uh, other countries out there are laughing at us. And I don't think that this is a, uh, a, 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 this is not a outside the mainstream thought that many people have. Maybe I'm crazy. I think if you want to criticize the U.S., you're welcome to within it. But if you're going to represent us on the foreign stage, then talking and thinking about it really is not going to be helpful whenever you're talking to the Chinese Communist Party, who the last time I was in China, I was told to shut my mouth when I was in Tiananmen Square. So yeah, whenever they want to acknowledge that, that's fine. And I saw that very vividly on display. And a lot of people made a lot about this, where I want your thoughts on it, was when Anthony Blinken, was sitting across in Alaska, from, he's our Secretary of State, from uh, the Chinese, I think he was the Foreign Minister, I forget his name. And again, he was doing, he, he was actually using this against him, you know, being, oh, the racial problems of the US, Black Lives Matter, and Blinken is like, yes, of, of course, you know, we had problems here, and uh, uh. it he's just seemed completely flat-footed. I'm not gonna make the caricature a lot of conservatives did. I thought he handled himself okay, but I did think it was a very striking moment of when wokeness is easily weaponized against the United States by people who do not give a damn about human rights or racial equality or anything. So I'm curious for your thoughts on that, especially in the context of the Chinese perspective, because they seem thrilled um, with a lot of this, for at least from what I can see in a lot of their state media. Right. They, um, in a way, uh, and I think this is a weakness of the of Chinese foreign policy. They are very imitative. Um, so they they see the U.S. criticize China for its uh, human rights record, and, and their reaction is to sort of uh, throw the ball right at, r right back at the U.S. and use exactly the same criticism. So I'm, I don't. I'm, I'm personally not particularly impressed by that. Um, <laughs> But uh, on, on, on that question in particular, well, I saw a tweet today by Bill Crystal, and I've been very interested in his evolution, which seems uh, rather curious. <laughs> I, I was his TF uh, 20 years ago at Harvard, and that's not the same wow. Bill Crystal that I remember. And so wow. he was saying, this is great that we criticize our own country. Uh, the founders also criticized uh, our country. Now, I do think he, he has a point. So this is part of the American tradition. And when I think he was responding to a Pompeo speech or tweet as well. Yes, uh, right. These days. Uh, and I, I think on that particular dispute, uh, I'm, I'm with, with Bill Crystal. Uh, it's not part of the American tradition to say that the Constitution and the regime are perfect. Uh, but I agree with you that it's also not part of the American political tradition to say that the whole experiment is corrupt, 
uh, from the start uh, and irredeemable, which some people on, on the far left or even the left say. So I guess the sort of balance where you're able to self-criticize, uh, but you also, because Bill Crystal is wrong that the founders only, the founders were very capable and did it all the time to present the American experiment as the brightest light of mankind and mankind's last hope and, and something that had never been done. Uh, so they, they were self-critical, but for the most part, they tended to inhale the, the American experiment. So now, if we enter a world where American elites are constantly self-flagellating, I do agree with you that this would yeah. be a problem. Self-criticism is not self-flagellation, right? I have an interesting question, which I've always wondered. How do you guys in Europe get off the hook for this? Um, like, no offense, you're Portuguese. I mean, Brazil is an interesting country. Um, like Spain, whenever I see Spain, I'm like, how do you guys, you know, I mean, South America, in terms of you want to read and talk about Spanish atrocity, like I do not see a sizable part of the Portuguese population, maybe I'm crazy, like please correct me if I'm wrong, who is like, we must correct the sins of Vasco da Gama, or, you know, in Spain, be like, we need to apologize for the sins of Hernan Cortez, or the German, I mean, even Germany today, maybe the best example. I mean, they're not talking about like reparations of Czechoslovakia, and then, and which actually probably makes even more sense given that that happened in 1942, or in the UK, I think where you are right now, I've always wondered. Yeah, that's, I'm like, that's, hey, that's, I'm, that's that. Well, that's happening. It's in the not UK part right of now. the UK. No, it's nah, not. Though. That's not totally even happening close in the UK. To, taking down a Winston Churchill statue is not the same thing as having a well, sizable portion of people saying the Bengal, which you know, I'm an Indian, like the Bengal famine of 1943. I I don't understand why this is such a unique character um, of the United States and how the Europeans themselves that, reckon with that. That's a good question. And, and actually yeah. Portugal would be the perfect example because we were leaders in the slave trade, uh, for, right. for yeah. centuries. I think in fact, that, that famous ship that arrived in 1619, that has been topic of, of great debate in the U S was a Portuguese ship coming from around Angola to the U S and we were, um, making fortunes for centuries, uh, up until the, 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 the 19th century, uh, and really sort of uh, at some point it became our main source of income, no longer gold or spices, but the slave trade. Now, it's not talked about in Portugal. There's no self-flagellation whatsoever. It's not debated. How do we get away with that? Um, uh, well, by, by just ignoring it, <laughs> I guess that's <laughs> it. Uh, and uh, I, I have to say, I, I don't find that, uh, you know, I've even suggested at times that we should have a national debate on how we're rolling the slave trade, but it just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, it goes to, to the topic of my previous book a little bit. The US is captured by these myths, by, by, by these stories. Um, we are in a way more rationalistic. Uh, we had a certain theory of race. We've concluded that it's wrong. We've moved on, uh, but we're not captured into this, in these myths, these narratives that we can never escape. Uh, uh, we, we changed our mind about race and, and, that, and, and, and we've moved on. I think that's generally the approach in, in continental Europe. Um, and in a way, it has worked at some level, but obviously, I mean, some of us still think that we should have a debate about these things um, and that it's something missing and that we'll never be able, because we shouldn't present our experience experiment as successful in the sense that Portugal has 10% like population, France, I think a, a bit more around 15. And, and these, this population is not integrated. Um, you know, I think in Portugal or France, essentially you see a black person playing football, singing, and that's about it. Not represented, certainly not in the universities, not among judges, lawyers, um, uh, a little bit politicians because of the tokenistic element of it, but not in the elites. And so we do have a problem uh, that is not solved. And so I'm not going to present our case as actually a, a model in that sense. And just to interject on this, because <clears throat> I actually completely disagree. The reason why a, you know, Germany isn't a particularly relevant example here is because Germany solved 
the problems they had, which is that German gave up its attempt to dominate Western Europe. The German army has 65,000 people in it, right? Like that's yeah, solved. Right. Prussia was literally wiped from the face of the earth and given to Russia and the Baltic states. The country itself was changed. Country, you know, a country like Japan, Japan, whoa, 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 like East Asia Coast Prosperity Sphere, lots of things to um, <laughs> apologize for. And that was rectified by a constitution written by the US that literally prevents that from ever happening again. So the reason why this is a thing in America is because in this case, America is an exceptional country. It's not fashionable to talk about American exceptionalism, but I mean, in this very literal level, the debates that we're having over race and society, regardless of which direction you're coming at it from, so regardless if you're a super conservative MAGA person or a 1619 project buying you know, New York Times reader, the debates are still open. I don't know what Portuguese debate around the slaves trade is still relevant. Now, if Portugal's population was 50-50, um, black, um, you know, black descendant and just white long-term Portuguese descendant, I could easily see a conversation around slavery still being relevant. But I just don't know in what cases we're referring where there's an alternate model. And even in France and the UK, of which I think are the two most relevant examples where there are serious debates over wokeness, it's because there are unanswered questions. There are unanswered questions in France, like you said, Bruno, over African immigrants. The, the, the French empire is interesting in the sense that the French empire nominally extended citizenship to Africans and members of the empire outside of Europe in a way that was a level higher than the British and also had a very, you know, what was it, the civilization? Like, I'm not going to even try to do French stuff here. They were but like, you're the, French. You're the French mission, like the, the French, French the French, yeah. the French civilizing mission. There, that, you know, right. it was, it's, it's me, and Bruno, like, I'll, I'll let you go, but it's just, it's the quick thing on this is. Of, you yeah. just remember what I think is, is also a critical difference in, in the end. Um, so even though Portugal was leading the slave trade, uh, slavery was was kept outside the country. Didn't By and large, slaves were, were were not brought into Portugal. Um, they were kept in Brazil, working in the plantations, Cape Verde, San Tomé, or then sold to uh, to the uh, to to the plant owners in um, in uh, in the southern states in the U.S. or elsewhere. Uh, so in a way, and, and there's something hypocritical about it because we were involved in it uh, to our neck, but it did not become a structural part of Portuguese society in the way that it is a structural part of American That's a good society. Point. Uh, and so that I think helps and something that hadn't occurred to me when, when responding to Saga. Now, morally, I don't think it makes a difference, but sociologically and politically, uh, it does make a, a, a very significant difference. The Portuguese economy and Portuguese society developed on a parallel track, whereas slavery was happening in Brazil or Africa, but not here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I could spend all day here, but I do actually have a question that I do wanna get with you. There's a lot going on in China in terms of their internal conceptions of themselves, I find very interesting, which is that it seemed for a long time to me, China would build up these billionaires or allow them to become billionaires and use them as faces of like Jack Ma versus Jeff Bezos, having Didi versus Uber. And something happened very recently where they all just seemed to completely change. Uh, they were like, hey, Jack Ma, you're getting a little too big for your britches. Uh, you're, you're, you know, you're having too many dinners in New York. Uh, you're under arrest for like three months, and you're going to do this really weird hostage video. Also, your company's not going public. Also, we own you, just, just so you remember. Um, the DD thing, I think, is just crazy. I mean, we're talking about, what is it, a $75 billion company? Um, I, frankly, probably better than Uber um, in terms of its financials and in terms of its user base. Obviously, they have a bias because it works in China, but they're like, no, you're you're out off the App Store. I I couldn't believe it. What What is happening there so rapidly in their conception of themselves and their own economy? Right, great question. I... You know, in my day job as a, as a consultant for some uh, big companies, uh, multinationals, I, I've gotten this question a lot over the past year. People are interested, worried. Uh, they want to know what's going on. So it's a, it's a great question. Now, we don't know everything. 
not even the reporters there haven't haven't really done a very convincing work of answering your question. We do know a few things. So, uh, you know, back then when it started with Jack Ma, people were asking me, is he going to be arrested? And I said, no, he's not going to be arrested. And I, I, I was right. He wasn't arrested. This is not the Soviet Union trying to decapitate its capitalist class. This is the, the Communist Party trying to steer Chinese society and the Chinese economy in a certain direction and trying to correct what they see as an exaggerated drift uh, uh, towards something that they don't like. These companies were becoming too powerful. The CEOs were starting to think that they were untouchable. The CEOs were starting to be, think of themselves more as global figures than Chinese figures. Uh, in the same way that American billionaires also do that. Um, yeah. And by the way, you're seeing sim- let's let's be uh, let's be honest here. You're seeing similar phenomenon also in the in the US. Uh, you see, the Mark Zuckerberg uh, suddenly is uh, surfing uh, with an American flag, <laughs> and he wasn't doing that five years ago. So you know, the, these CEOs of big tech companies are feeling the pressure. And actually, I think this is a case where China is evolving on a parallel track to Europe and the US. It actually doesn't seem to me as one of the examples where China is behaving in an incomprehensible way. What it's doing is rein in some of these large companies, try to rethink the regulatory framework for data. It's happening in Europe and it's happening in the US. Now, it takes a specific Chinese form, very opaque, non-transparent, uh, no one really knows what's happening. Uh, but I don't think it's that surprising, that odd, that exotic or strange. It's the way I see it in large measure to influence also a new generation of tech CEOs uh, who will think of themselves differently, uh, will think themselves as in the end, their goal should be the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation and even the geopolitical goals that China has and that it's confrontation with the US, that's also important. In a moment of acute confrontation with the US, China cannot afford for its large tech companies to think of their interests before thinking of the national interest. So I think it's a set of uh, corrections in Mm -hmm. what they saw as drifting. Interesting. Two, Two things here. Is it the national interest or is it the Chinese Communist Party's interest? Because this is the problem. Because I found myself saying, hmm, he's not actually saying anything that I could find that much analytical fault with. But I think the Western liberal part of me that finds fault with it is the CCP wants tech company founders who fit within the CCP. And I do also do not believe the CCP as is no government on earth is the perfect understander of any nation's interests. So I could see someone who is on the right and is very skeptical of tech power. Someone on the left who's skeptical of tech power saying, man, directionally, what's happening here is really great because you're having these tech founders get checked because they're weirdly globalist or they're overly libertarian. But my pushback is that that's like saying that Joe Biden or the Democratic Party or Trump's Republican Party are the real adjudicators of what America's true national interest is. So can you just get at, I think, what I'm finding to be uncomfortable about, I think, the direction of, I, I, about the direction that people, because let me put it a better way. I've heard too many center-left, tech-skeptical people praise what's happening in China in a way that I think is actually deeply naive and doesn't quite understand what's happening. So you say, you, you for example, uh, Sagar, it's Kara Swisher and Scott Galloway saying, oh, you know, whoa, in China, they're confronting this tech problem in a way that American politicians just aren't doing. I'm like, that isn't quite what's happening here. So I think that's why I'm getting uncomfortable. <laughs> right. No, there are many important differences that we have to underline. Well, first of all, you say, you know, who's Joe Biden to decide uh, how tech companies should should be organized. Uh, well, at, at least in the case of the US, you can say, well, he was elected by the American people. You can't say that about Xi Jinping, right? So that's an important difference. Let's not forget about it. Then, uh, 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 you know, Europe uh, is also concerned with these topics, but it is clear that in Europe, regulation of, of big tech is for the sake of something like individual autonomy, control over my own data. That's what people will tell me in Brussels. 
In China, it's not this. Sometimes this concern appears, but essentially is the geopolitical confrontation and the geopolitical goals that China has to become equal to the United States by the middle of the century and overcome the United States in the second half of the century. And these companies have to work for that end. Now, you may think that this end uh, should not take precedent over individual autonomy and so on. So I, I do think we, we can bring up these differences. Uh, on the other hand, I'm not 100% comfortable with this idea of saying, you know, the Chinese Communist Party does not represent the Chinese people. So here's what I think is in the interest of the Chinese people, because it also seems that I'm not the most adequate person or that Tom Cotton is not the most adequate person to represent the interests of the Chinese people. And if I were the Chinese people, I wouldn't trust Tom Cotton to represent my interests. Let me put it that way. Mm. Uh, so what is the alternative, right? We're a bit stuck here because we can agree that the CCP does not represent the Chinese people, but it's also a bit naive to say it's in the interest of the of the Chinese people to give free reign to these companies, to liberalize the economy. Certainly what they will tell you in Beijing is when, when the Soviet Union and Russia followed the advice of, Amer of Western consultants, it didn't work out well, and it does seem to have worked out better so far for China. So trying to, to have a kind of a, a balanced position here. It's not a democratic process. It's not for the sake of the individual. We are completely entitled to disagree with that. Um, but in the end, um, it's, you know, the, the path where we would elect ourselves as representatives of the Chinese people also seems to me rather absurd. Hmm. Um, and just to quickly put a, addendum, a better addendum to what I was saying and then get to the last question here. What I'm saying is if you could critique Jack Ma, Mark Zuckerberg, pick any billionaire as being disinterested from their countrymen to globalist, all those things. That's that's an entirely fair and in many ways very valid critique. But I think the critique of the CCP would be that the CCP is focused on itself. So the CCP would say, because like you're obviously correct, like Tom Cotton, if I were a Chinese person, I would not say Tom Cotton and various DC think tanks are good speakers for what the Chinese people actually want. That's not the claim. My point is, I think the CCP also thinks that it is China and it is just not China. It represents China, but too often I think the national interest very conveniently happens to align with the Nash, with the interests of a very specific set of people. So here's, here's the last question here, because I've always been fascinated by how much the American Silicon Valley community is really interested in, in your work. You, you, you come up all the time. You recently wrote a piece that was really good in A16Z, Andreessen Horowitz's new publication. Do you think that the China that China's becoming is capable of creating tech companies that could compete and win on the global stage? Because not to be a tech show for a second, but like at its core, Tech is libertarian in terms of small L libertarian. It's not nationally dictated. This, 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 and that, especially outside of the defense sector. Do you think that the China that has a tech sector that is much more top down, founders aren't necessarily rebels, but they're more people who could fit within a CCP system? How do you think those companies are going to fare? And then does the question even matter? Because I could easily see the pushback being, yeah, China's going to subordinate its ability to create unicorns and instead preference national solidarity by 2049. So I'm just curious how you think about those two questions. So uh, very quick, going back to the previous question, you're, you're right. Besides the geopolitical goals, there are also internal goals having to do with control and power. So some people actually speculate that Xi Jinping is going after some of these companies because the ownership, ownership structure favors some of his rivals inside the party. Uh, we don't know enough. Uh, this also happens in the West, but it is important to also not be naive and, and, and think that in some cases, the interest might be directly related to Xi Jinping's personal interest and not to China's geopolitical goals. So I didn't mention that before, it's important to keep in mind. Now, your question, I just had a very interesting discussion with a, a, an important figure in Silicon Valley. They, they are very interested in this. So how to interpret recent developments in terms of China's aspirations to become a tech power? Um, 
I don't think we, again, should be naive in terms of thinking that you need to be a liberal democracy to be a tech power. Historical experience doesn't show that. Uh, historical experience shows you had uh, Newtonian England um, uh, technological development, scientific discovery happen with a regime that was not democratic or liberal. Renaissance Florence still remains the model for creativity, ingenuity, and uh, it was and it, it was a an auto- what today would call an autocracy led by the Medici. So that's kind of important to keep in mind, not be completely sentimental and naive about these things. On the other hand, I do agree that you need a level of uh, free discussion. You need people to feel that they are free to innovate. And there's a genuine question whether, you know, when I was living in China in 2019, it seemed to me that tech in particular had been insulated from political pressure and that young people actually flowed into the tech sector in the internet economy because they felt free there, as opposed to other areas, um, journalism or or other things. Um, Politics there isn't in China, but other areas that were more subject to political control. Now, whether that is still the case, I'm not sure. Uh, Certainly we've been receiving some news that seem to point towards a certain chilling effect I don't, I'm not sure these numbers of unicorns are entirely up to date or entirely rigorous, but still something seems to be happening. People seem to be less comfortable. If um, by rising too fast, you get in trouble like Jack Ma did, and um, then you might not want to do it. I so think that, we already answered the, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. So, uh, so I think, uh, you know, we, we need to, 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 to keep following these developments. Um, the picture of the last 10 years, I think, was encouraging for China. We see fast developments doing things like were very difficult to do in the West. For example, the idea of a super app was very difficult to do under regulatory conditions in the US that would uh, regulators would never allow would never allow for something like WeChat, too much power. Uh, now, has that changed? Uh, and uh, is actually, is the CCP in that sense shooting itself in the foot by killing what were the crown jewels of, of, of the Chinese economy. Uh, I don't think we, it, I think it's a bit too soon to answer that, to be honest. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I'll just say this. I think we already answered this question. Zhang Jimin, CEO of ByteDance, he bowed. He was like, sorry. You know, I, I forget what his even crime was. By the way, if you're listening, ByteDance is the one who owns TikTok and he's the inventor of TikTok. He deleted an app off the app store. He keeps his app. Uh, our regulators are such idiots that they allow that app to now currently have more use time in the West and in the United States than Instagram. So, I mean, I think we answered this question. Like, And I know like we like to do the unicorn thing. I, I'm not necessarily if unicorn is the right metric. I mean, if you can create the second most popular social media app in your geopolitical rival, I think you did win. And I think that you can show that it can easily be done again and again and again. And, you know, for every Jack Ma uh, or DD, ByteDance continues to operate. I keep, I don't want to mispronounce his name. I think is Zhang Zimin, I think is his name. Um, he's worth $45 billion and he's a crown jewel of the, of the Chinese empire. And I think there will be probably many more like him um, because they have that, that opportunity and ability to have native and ability, uh, native like uh, understanding, expertise, and more. They have a billion users, which they can self-isolate from competing products, and they have a Western system, which is open. So it just seems very clear to me. I would, I think, I would rather be them uh, right now on this side of the debate. And I, I'm, I'm curious for your final thoughts on that. Uh, well, you know. Uh I think this is still an open question. And uh, let me sort of turn the, the flashlight on the US. Uh, we know that, that, that the US system also has problems. One thing that I discovered the more I, I learn about Silicon Valley, for example, is we, we used to think, and it was in Portuguese government, that's what I thought, that the venture capital system was perfect. Uh, certainly much better than bank credit to promote innovation and fast growth in companies. But, you know, recently I started to realize, uh, you know, these, um, the, the big VCs, they're supposed to be picking the next wave of companies, the disruptors. Many of them sit on the board of Facebook and, and Google and other places. How can you be 
promoting the, 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 the wave of companies that are going to, you know, uh, the, the idea should be for the next wave of companies to actually destroy Facebook and Google. That's what they did to, to their competitors. But if the people in charge of uh, financing the next wave of companies actually have a vested interest in protecting the ones that are there already. So uh, I think to, 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 be, to be direct on this, I, I do think that the Chinese authorities, when they think about this, are actually concerned about things like competition. Let me leave you with that thought. Uh, this is not the Soviet Union. And so part of their calculations, we've already said, you know, it may even be in large measure Xi Jinping's uh, personal goal powers and so on. We just don't know enough. The, the procedure is not, not transparent enough. But I can tell you from experience that they are also concerned in promoting an economy that is ruthlessly competitive. And it is. Every businessman you talk to in China, particularly in Shenzhen, they tell you that uh, some of them have, have worked in the U.S. and they find the environment in the U.S. much more sedate. That they, you know, when they work there, they could sleep and so on. When they go to China, partly because intellectual property is not protected, so your only way to defend against your competitors is to grow so fast that they don't stand a chance. But right. to rely on courts and intellectual property is not going to get you very far in China. A ruthlessly competitive environment. That's why you walk around Shenzhen at 11 p.m. and you see all the office lights on and you don't see that in Silicon Valley. So, you know, the U.S. has to be aware. And I'm sometimes puzzled why people are not aware of this. You are not dealing with the gerontocracy of the Soviet Union. These people know how, how an economy works. Uh, sometimes when they deviate from the American model, they deviate in order to make it hotter, more competitive, faster. Um, so it is a, it's a ruthless, serious competitor at this level. Uh, and there's a lot of complacency. And it's, when things like this happen, I think it fits with pe people's previous model. They say, well, here's the Soviet Union eliminating its capitalist class. We have nothing to worry about. It's not what's happening there. Yeah. Really well said, Bruno. This has been one of my favorite episodes. So, oh, Marshall, you have something? No, I was gonna. Yeah, literally said you took the words from my mouth. So, Bruno, yeah. thank you so much. Um, where where can people find your upcoming works, recent books? Your you have a Substack. You should plug all the good stuff. I th I think the best is is just to follow me on Twitter because I'm always there, uh, uh, linking to my most recent stuff and giving news. Uh, so, and I know I promise it's going to be worth it if you, if your listeners follow me, uh, there will be interesting stuff on Twitter and all the rest is going to be linked on Twitter. So don't worry. Awesome. I can guarantee that, uh, for everybody listening and watching link will be right there in the show notes. Really appreciate you joining us, Bruno. Thank you. Great pleasure as always. Thanks. Absolutely. Best of luck. And, uh, the show has been doing great. So I, I just wish you, you keep doing as well. 